Welcome to the Dark Knight 1 to 90 leveling skills guide. In this guide we'll cover all of your skills as you train to dead parents better than the rest of them, but also hopefully kill your enemies along the way. Watch as you go from this... ...to this. This series is framed in the mindset of players completely new to Final Fantasy XIV, or the MMO genre in general, or generally still inexperienced. In that same vein, this will merely be an overview of the actions and how to use them. Optimal rotations are better left to their own in-depth videos just due to how much complexity is involved in perfect openers and overall rotations. This is not meant to be a purely optimal guide. If you wish to be optimal at level cap, there are further places you can research your job on. We will, however, be crafting rotations as we go to help new players understand what goes through creating openers and give them a foothold to push themselves into being able to do it on their own. The goal is to draw players in on the ground level so they can make strides to improve themselves. All tooltips will be shown at the level cap for each section. Level 50 for Realm Reborn, level 60 for Heavensward skills, level 70 for Stormblood stuff, level 80 for Shadowbringers levels, and level 90 for Endwalker. I also recommend all players add Sprint and Limit Break to their hotbars, both found in the General tab of your Actions menu. And as for how my hotbars build, it'll make sense at 90. Just put skills in your hotbars in a way you feel comfortable using as you are leveling. Everyone has their own way of doing things. If you want more info on how I set up my UI, check the description or the card for a video on it. And keep the following in mind, patches can change jobs still. Be sure to check the description for any patch notes for minor potency changes, or skill changes, or any other special notes. With all that out of the way, let's begin. Dark Knight is likely the most complex and hardest tank to play. The only tank with a need to actually manage the MP bar, used both offensively and defensively, a gauge to build up and spend as best you can, a lot of attacking buttons that arguably pushes it past Gunbreaker as being the most DPS-like of the tanks. You also tend to differ from other tanks with what specific cooldowns you have and their effects. This includes what is argued to be the best targeted ability in the game, able to block a big hit on yourself or any party member, with Endwalker further adding onto how much of that you can do. To obtain Dark Knight, you need to reach the Heavensward expansion, which is immediately accessible upon completion of A Realm Reborn. The final quest of it is called Before the Dawn. Head into Ishgard's The Pillars, go to the Tribunal in the north, and you will have yourself a Dark Knight. Let's get into the finer details of each skill. We start at 30 with a bit to go over. First is our roll actions. We start with Rampart, Low Blow, Provoke, Interject, and Reprisal. This is a lot of stuff that you will be using quite often. I won't be going over these here, instead directing you to the corner or the description for a dedicated video on tank roll actions. I especially recommend this one. Level 1, Tank Mastery. You likely started with one of the other tanks, so you should be used to this by now. It's weirdly worded to say you get bonus health and strength while also a passive 20% damage reduction. The bonus health is obvious, but your damage is below that of a DPS, so the strength bit is weird. Level 1, 2, and 26, Hard Slash, Siphon Strike, and Soul Eater. This is our basic combo. You always want to hit this combo in order. This will have you do a 150, 240, and then 320 potency hit to a single target. It's a basic combo, but the second and third hits have extra effects. Siphon Strike also restores some MP, 600 of it. Dark Knight will be spending MP, so this MP generation is very important. Soul Ada, meanwhile, finishes the combo with a 300 potency heal. This is a little bit of a mitigation reduction of damage, with helping the healer keep you up in bosses. It isn't much, but it does exist. We'll have further reasons to finish the combo later, so just remember to do your combos. Level 6, Unleash. This is our AoE, or Area of Effect, attack. It has a 5 yarm range, doing 120 potency to all enemies within that range. You have to be in the middle of packs of enemies to hit them all ideally, and you want to be spamming this if there are 3 or more enemies. On 2 enemies, just alternate your main combo between both enemies to maintain aggro. The more enemies you pull, the more you want to be using Unleash. The damage adds up quickly, as does your need to maintain the enmity lead on all of them. On any group of enemies though, you usually want to start every encounter with an Unleash just to get a base level of enmity on all of them. Single targets? You can skip the Unleash. Simply put though, AoE attack, hit as many enemies as you can for enmity and damage. Also, this is marked as a spell, 
With little exception, this doesn't mean much. It won't be affected by skill speed, nor will the other skills marked as spells. Level 10, Grit. This is Dark Knight's enmity stance. You have a UI element, this gem. That shows if the buff is running. If you see spikes, you're generating extra enmity. In most cases, you always want this on with the exceptions of 8 player or more content, which usually has multiple tanks. But otherwise, this multiplies all enmity generated by something like 10 times. The party list has an enmity gauge. The enmity of the current target will be displayed under your icons, along with a number or a letter. You want to have an A signaling you have the lead over anyone else. The enemy list also has an enmity indicator. Anything but a red square is bad for you. Red square is the leader, so you want every enemy to have that. The mentioned exceptions are in larger scale content. There are two to three tanks depending on what you are doing, and you don't want to be fighting for the enmity lead. You could just end up getting allies killed if you do. Only one of you takes control of the boss, the other tank's in charge of adds, additional enemies, or the boss when the other tank is unable to tank. Generally, whoever puts the enmity stance up first is in charge. Every tank has a version of grit. Same effects, but name, icon, and animation are different. You'll get used to them as you progress, but it's at least a rule you can follow. Or go based on who has the most gear. Or better yet, just talk. Type and communicate. Controller users on PlayStation, a cheap $5 USB keyboard will work. It's worth it. Beyond who is currently tanking, be ready to take control if the other tank dies. A minute or so into a fight, turn grit on to generate enmity even as the off tank. This will put you in second place above your allies. This will lead the boss to attack you instead of quickly eating your squishier allies. Move into position two. Bosses should always be facing away from the party. The main worry is when you level sync with lower level duties. You will quickly level up and doing roulettes will give you, say, Sestasha. Anytime you go into a duty with syncing, grit will need to be turned on. Every single duty you do that isn't your current level, hit grit the moment you can. Otherwise, just turn it on and enjoy being eaten alive. Level 15, Unmend. This is our ranged attack. It's for engagement and positioning. You can hit any enemies within 20 yarms, dealing 150 potency of damage. It has a further enmity multiplier on top, so any enemy hit by this will be much less likely to be ripped away from you, or for getting an enemy back to you after being ripped away. Great for positioning new targets or reaching a further away, but still important to grab enemy. When running up to enemies, hit on men to start dragging the enemies to you. It gives you a quick entry into the fight proper, and for you to get enmity sooner with Unleash. For bosses, you can get them into the middle of the arena from the edge. Bosses usually want to be placed mid, with exception. Other than as an engagement tool, you don't use Unmend much. There's extremely rare cases where you'll be out of range of a boss and can't attack other than Unmend. But that's very rare. Usually only when the boss explicitly is forcing you to run far away, like with a very big AoE around it. And even when we do need to run out, we run right back in after. Level 30, Flood of Darkness. I really hope I don't need to mention this by this point, but do your job quests. This is the first of many job quest lock skills. Do them. I won't be mentioning this further beyond the card in the top left saying it is quest locked. Flood has a one second cooldown just so you can't super spam it, is an ability so you can weave it, and it has a massive 3,000 MP cost. It is an AoE with a 10 yarn range, shooting in a line in the direction of your current target. It deals 100 potency to all enemies, but you will use this in single target too, which is where that 600 MP from Siphon Strike comes in. It may only be 100 potency, but it's still more damage. On top of that damage though is the other UI element we have. The Dark Side gauge will light up upon using Flood of Darkness. Dark Side is a 10% damage increase while it lasts. Using Flood of Darkness will give 30 seconds of Dark Side, multiple uses increasing the timer further up to the maximum of 60 seconds. For the most part, you're going to use Flood of Darkness anytime you can. Spending your mana as you get it will keep Dark Side running all but permanently. But something you can try practicing now, always have 3000 mana available outside of openers. Our level 70 skill is extremely useful and important, but is also going to cost us mana. So practicing some mana economy is going to be helpful later. Otherwise, if you have mana, spend it for damage and dark side. 
It's a pretty basic start, but it is more than the two tank classes start with. But ultimately, it just boils down to a basic combo, an AoE, a ranged move to pull, and the usual tank stuff. Let's get a bit more stuff before we get into building any sort of opener. Level 32 is a quick return to roll actions. Arm's Length comes in and is in fact a defensive cooldown. Yes, for real. Level 35, Blood Weapon. Blood Weapon has a 60 second cooldown, granting you 5 stacks of itself for 15 seconds. Using spells or weapon skills will grant you 600 MP for each stack, or a total 3000 MP. If you use, say, Unleash, you will only gain 600 MP still. AoE attacks do not give MP for every enemy hit. You should have about 5 seconds of leeway to use all 5 stacks. Simply put, use this on cooldown and make sure you aren't at maximum mana. Be sure you're spending mana with Flood of Darkness, especially with Blood Weapon up. Siphon Strike is 1200 mana when used under Blood Weapon. Generation is pretty fast all things considered. So again, be sure to spend mana and use Blood Weapon on cooldown for some big MP regen. Level 38, Shadow Wall. This is your big mitigation. On a 2 minute cooldown, this reduces all incoming damage by 30% for 15 seconds. This is ideal for big tank busters when paired with short but weaker cooldowns, or for reducing the damage in trash pools. When you go and pull 10 enemies at once, 30% less damage is a huge boost. 2 minutes is also lengthy, but not as lengthy as it could be. Be willing to throw out Shadow Wall anytime there is going to be big damage. Bosses and trash both deserve the cooldowns. But especially big pulls in trash. Trash is more dangerous than bosses. Level 40, Stalwart Soul. This is our AoE combo. After using Unleash, you can use Stalwart Soul for a 140 potency hit to all enemies within 5 yams, just like Unleash. But on top of that is a 600 MP regen for every combo of Stalwart Soul. Before, in AoE, all your MP regen was the small passive regen and blood weapon anytime it comes up. Now we have 600 MP every other attack we do. It's a bigger hit in AoE and allows us to use Flood of Darkness more than before to take enemies down. Level 40, Edge of Darkness. This is going to replace Flood of Darkness in single target. It has the same recast, MP cost, and even shares a recast timer with Flood of Darkness. Dark Side is also still applied. It deals 300 potency of damage to a single enemy, being as strong as Flood on three enemies. By now you should have practice on spending MP in single target anyway, but now it's actually going to be a bit more effective than a measly 100 potency. Level 45, Dark Mind. On a 60 second cooldown, Dark Mind reduces all magic damage by 20% for 10 seconds. This is a very specific note to make. Magic only. This makes it a very specific use cooldown. Either to personally reduce raid-wide damage a bit, damage that will barely tickle you anyway, or magic tank busters. There is currently no way to know an attack is magic or physical, other than just watching the animation or name. And sometimes animations can be misleading, but not always. So this really hinges on good guessing or knowing enemy types. And in trash mobs, the effect will be pretty minor. It has a short cooldown, so there's little reason not to use it in trash, but in any wall-to-wall -wall pool, and usually in even any single pool, only half the enemies will be using magic attacks of any kind. So at worst you are gaining something from using it, but it won't be as strong as some of your other abilities on average. But when this is good, it is very good. Our final roll action is Shirk at level 48. Level 50, Living Dead. This skill has a lot of layers. First, this has a 5 minute cooldown, because this is Dark Knight's ultimate, or Invuln skill. Invuln being invulnerability. This grants Living Dead for 10 seconds. When under Living Dead, you cannot die with very few exceptions, usually relegated to high-end raid mechanics. When hitting 0 HP, Living Dead will expire and leave you at 1 HP instead. In its place, you will gain Walking Dead for 10 seconds. Within this 10 second timer, you still cannot die, remaining at 1 HP. You have until Walking Dead runs out to be healed your max HP worth of HP or you will automatically die no matter how much HP you have. You do not need to be healed to max, only healed the amount equaling your max. 
So even if you are only halfway to max HP while still taking damage, Walking Dead won't kill you. Walking Dead has one other effect, but the tooltip makes it seem like Living Dead gives this buff. Well, under Walking Dead, all weapon skills and spells will have an attached 1500 potency heal. This applies to all enemies hit when it is an AoE attack. So if you hit Unleash on, say, six enemies, that is an automatic 9,000 potency heal. Once you have been healed for your max HP worth of healing, Walking Dead will become Undead Rebirth. Copying the timer of Walking Dead, this ensures that you will get the full 10 seconds of invulnerability. However, you lose the healing effect of Walking Dead. So in boss fights, this can be a really good emergency button, or in high-end raiding, you'll be using this very intentionally to skip some mechanics or tank busters. The self-heal will heal most of what you need, so even just one heal thrown you away from a healer will ensure you don't die to Walking Dead. And if you do still die to Walking Dead, you at least survived an extra 10 seconds. In trash mobs, you guaranteed survival on basically any multi-pool. One single unleash is going to fully heal you, and if at 90 when healing is overall less effective, if it isn't enough with just one unleash, the stalwart soul you do after will be what brings you all the way over the max HP worth of healing. This, however, ends up being some anti-synergy in a way. For the closest comparison, look at Warrior when they combine raw intuition with home gang. You wait for the home gang timer to hit two or three seconds left, pop raw intuition, and heal yourself. To do the same thing as Dark Knight, you pop Living Dead, hit 1 HP, then stand there doing nothing until the timer gets low. Then you can unleash. If you aren't using it with such laser-focused intent, it ends up being quite a bit less effective. It is at least worth one full HP bar's worth of damage ignored. If you go into a pool with no mitigations except Living Dead, hit 1 HP, then immediately unleash, you'll heal right back up to max. So again, you at least had one full HP bar of ignoring damage. It's just not as much as a full HP bar plus the 10 second timer. Just be sure you tell your healer your plan before doing it. A white mage is even further anti-synergy if they say, use benediction not realizing your plan, or using holy while under living dead instead of also pausing their own attack. You should tell your healer about any ultimate cooldown usage, but this one especially needs communication. But invulns aside, we have openness to talk about. There is still very little to do overall. It's at least something to get us started though, practicing MP economy for later levels. Pre-pull, grit, provoke, hard slash, edge of darkness, blood weapon, siphon strike, Soul Eater, Edge of Darkness, Hard Slash, Edge of Darkness, Siphon Strike, Edge of Darkness, Soul Eater, Edge of Darkness. Before the open it itself, Grit and Provoke are only for if you are the tank. You want Grit on to maintain the enmity lead. Provoke is for the pull. Why not unmend? Because of later openers we can't afford an unmend. So we do our ranged pull and positioning with Provoke. It works fine enough. Dark Knight has a lot of weaving, and double weaving especially at level cap. We start off with an Edge of Darkness and Blood Weapon to both spend mana and kickstart our mana generation. We'll pause for Siphon Strike for a few reasons. One is preparing for when party buffs are a thing. The other is Potion Window for raiding if you ever get into it. After Soul Eater though, you just spam Edge of Darkness once per weave window. After a second full combo, you bottom out on your mana perfectly. You will have zero left, quite perfectly spending it all. Like I said, really simple to begin with. It gets a lot busier in no time though. Enjoy it while things are easy. And while it is easy, so is the karaoke opener. Karaoke openers are where I speak the names of the skills as they get used. The moment the name begins, the skill has gone off. Expect a lot of cutting myself off and names overlapping. So keep the starting point in mind. Pre-pull. Grit. Provoke. Hard slash. Edge of darkness. Blood weapon. Siphon strike. Soul leader. Edge of darkness. Hard slash. Edge of darkness. Siphon strike. Edge of darkness. Soul leader. Edge of darkness. 
As we head into the Heavensward skills, we're going to see a massive increase in weaving. It's a very offensive-based expansion toolkit. Level 52, Salted Earth. On a 90 second cooldown, this places a 5 yam AoE bubble around yourself. Any enemies inside of it will take 50 potency of damage, but not just once within the 15 second duration. This is a dot or damage over time. Dots work on server ticks, doing damage every 3 seconds. In total, that's 5 ticks of damage. However, the act of placing Salted Earth is also a tick of damage for 6 ticks of damage total. That's 300 potency of damage to all enemies in the bubble, so long as they are within the bubble for the full duration. Keep in mind that this place is on yourself. If you haven't corralled all the enemies into a tight circle already, do so, then place Salted in the middle of them, or try and move as many enemies into your AoE as best you can. On top of that, don't ignore this for bosses. Unless it is a very mobile boss that moves itself around a lot, it's just a free 300 potency of damage at any point. Use it on cooldown. Level 54, Plunge. Plunge does a 150 potency hit to a single target. The main use of this is the fact that it is a gap closer. You can jump straight to the enemy from up to 20 yams away. This reduces your need for unmen to hilariously low levels beyond as a pulling tool, but I would also like to emphasize that part. Please do not pull with this. Randomly jumping at the boss with no lead-up will surprise your team, and will often make it harder to move the boss into the middle of the arena. At least use Provoke or something, that at least won't spend any blood weapon. If you're not using it for the damage, which use these on cooldown if you don't need the utility, then you're using it for the gap closing effect. If you know you absolutely will be out of range of the boss for a moment, you can hold on to one of your uses of plunge to jump right back into range of the boss the moment the space around it becomes safe. Level 56, Abyssal Drain. On a 60 second cooldown, this does 150 potency to a target and all enemies within 5 yams of the target. It will recover 600 MP and 200 potency of healing. Unlike the MP heal though, the heal is 200 potency for every single enemy hit. This fact is extremely important because functionally, this works as mitigation. If you are sitting at half HP and use Abyssal Drain on 5 enemies, you will get 1000 potency of healing and see your HP bar jump up quite a bit. It will be extremely tempting to throw this out instantly in any battle for the damage. 150 potency per enemy is a good chunk, but waiting a few seconds for the heal can help up your survival in a fight even just a little bit. If nothing else, your healer can save one of their healing tools for a little bit later. Level 60, Carve and Spit. This actually shares a cooldown with Abyssal Drain. If you use one, they both go on the same 60 second cooldown. That is because this is your single target option. It gives 600 MP and deals 510 potency of damage to a single target. 200 potency of healing on just one enemy isn't significant enough on its own unless things are in an extreme emergency mode. Take the much higher damage instead, and use this on cooldown. No need to time it like Abyssal Drain. But otherwise, we have a lot more weaving opportunity now. Lots more attacking to slot into an opener, already pushing Dark Knight into a much harder version of itself. Pre-pull, grit, provoke, hard slash, Edge of Darkness, Blood Weapon, Siphon Strike, Soul Eater, Edge of Darkness, Salted Earth, Hard Slash, Edge of Darkness, Carve and Spit, Siphon Strike, Edge of Darkness, Plunge, Soul Eater, Edge of Darkness. Again, we're doing the bulk of things after Soul Eater because of raid buff timings. Technically, you could be using stuff sooner for making your own single weave opener, but we're gonna keep rolling with this pattern. We're keeping the opener otherwise exactly the same, except throwing out our new stuff in an order to maximize muscle memory. In terms of what is currently most important, Carven's Pit is our highest potency. But again, later on muscle memory, mostly for level 90. And don't expect the same amount of Edge of Darknesses either. But otherwise, that's the explanation for it. We're just throwing it all into double weave so we can get used to the constant weaving and some of the ordering. And while this has a much faster of a pace, I'm going to hold off on doing a karaoke opener for this one. We're going to get a lot more added with the level 70 opener, so we'll karaoke that one. So for that quick but easy fill in of skills, let's get into Stormblood. Things are going to change a lot with this one. 
Level 62, Black Blood and Blood Spiller. Black Blood adds an extension to our Enmity Gem here. It turns into a full sword gauge that fills upon completion of combos. Both Soul Eater and Stalwart Soul will give 20 Blood Gauge. Five combos will cap the gauge out at 100. This gauge will be spent on Blood Spiller. It is a GCD and costs 50 gauge to use. This will not break a combo if you use it mid-combo, and does an impressive 500 potency of damage to a target. You're going to want to get as many Blood Spillers out as you can. As you get Gage, throw them out. You're not really going to touch this for AoE though. It's stronger than your AoE combo on up to three enemies. It's a niche optimization only applicable to the level 61 dungeon because... Level 64, Quietus. This is our AoE Blood Spiller. Same rules all apply, except that this is a 5 Yom AoE around yourself that does 200 potency of damage to all enemies hit. That's stronger than Blood Spiller on three or more enemies. Quietus should get thrown out anytime you have the gauge available. It's a big boost to your AoE output. Level 66, Enhanced Black Blood. And now we're getting even more Blood Gauge with Blood Weapon. Every stack of Blood Weapon will give you 10 Blood Gauge. That's 50 Gauge, or an entire Blood Spiller or Quietus, regardless of which attacks you use. And because of the generation from your other attacks, you'll be building your Gauge fairly quickly. Quicker than you may expect. Keep an eye out any time you put up Blood Weapon. Don't forget to watch your MP2! Blood Weapon is generating two separate resources at once now. Level 68, Delirium. On a small 60 second cooldown, this will grant you three stacks of Delirium. Delirium stacks last for 15 seconds and have two effects. For one, that is essentially 150 free black blood. Each stack is a free use of Blood Spill It or Quietus. So careful of your gauge before hitting Delirium. You want to have some room to generate more while you are unable to spend it. There will usually be some overlap between Blood Weapon and Delirium since both have a 60 second cooldown. Secondly though is that this generates MP. Each use of Delirium as Blood Spiller is 200 MP, or 600 MP total. It's a very tiny amount, but it could lead you into a use of Edge of Darkness. Quietus, meanwhile, is 500 MP. This will be 1500 MP when using Delirium in AoE. That's a lot of extra MP and almost guaranteed to push you into a free Flood of Darkness. Final note will be the 15 second timer. You can pre-pop Delirium a bit before spending the stacks. Your other moves do not spend Delirium, and the Delirium attacks do not break your combos. So you could even go back and forth between combo hits and Delirium stacks. Not that you would want to, it just shows the flexibility of the stacks. Level 70, The Blackest Knight. On a short 15 second cooldown and costing 3000 MP, this places a shield on yourself or a target with 25% of the target's max HP. This lasts for 7 seconds, so there's very little leeway in getting the full strength of the shield. And you definitely want the full shield. The enemy needs to break it. When broken, you are granted Dark Arts. That's what this Dark Knight icon on the dark side gauge is for. It will light up yellow and will allow you one use of Edge or Flood of Darkness for free. As a result, you get a free shield for the same 300 MP cost for that Edge or Flood. I emphasize again though, it is when the shield is broken that you are given Dark Arts. If the timer runs out, no Dark Arts, regardless of how much is left in the shield. The uses of this are extremely varied. On yourself, for tank busters or high consistent damage in bosses, the consistent damage being mostly only Savage level stuff. Giving the shield to your co-tank for their taking tank busters or high consistent damage. That one DPS who has low HP due to poor healing or taking avoidable damage could use a shield to survive the next raid-wide attack. Trash pulls are also high consistent damage. Shielding yourself at 25% of your HP every 15 seconds is going to add up very quickly, with trash taking quite a bit more than 15 seconds usually. But given that's talking about multiple uses in a single fight, we come back to my warning. You need 3000 MP saved to be able to use the Blackest Knight. From this point now just called TBN. TBN was considered from Stormblood through Shadowbringers to be the strongest cooldown in the game by many. Any situation that spends the entire shield ends up being a huge boon. Less damage from enemies and no lost DPS. Something like that you want to be constantly using, which means MP management. 
always have 3,000 mana banked for TBN. If you don't, you're missing out on a huge part of your toolkit. This can be the hardest part to use right for both the MP reason and just general usage reasons. So we have the big, big damage that comes with wall-to-wall -wall pulling. No-brainer, use TBN. Tank busters, use TBN. But what about smaller pools? Do you ignore it? Or will the enemy spend the whole shield? Will the raid wide plus autos a boss do within 7 seconds spend the shield? There's no tank busters coming up, but you are taking damage. Can you reduce it? Sure, you could reduce it with TBN anyway, but if the shield doesn't break, that means it was very little damage. If you aren't in super emergency mode, it's little enough damage that the healer probably wouldn't even notice if you did or did not use TBN. It's this here that pushes TBN from just a god tier skill to an amazing skill that requires practice to use to maximum effect. It's not bad if you just only use it for those points you know it works. Tank busters and consistent trash damage from wall to wall pulls. But you could be missing out on even more if you don't try to move it out of the comfort zone. And so we have come to our next opener, and we're going to be making some major changes. The Blackest Knight is enough to shift things around, which may be surprising. Once we get through it, it will make sense though. We're trying to maximize our MP economy with this opener pattern. Pre-pull. Grit. Blood Weapon. The Blackest Knight. Provoke. Heart Slash. Edge of Darkness, Delirium, Siphon Strike, Soul Eater, Salted Earth, Hard Slash, Edge of Darkness, Blood Spiller, Carve and Spit, Plunge, Blood Spiller, Edge of Darkness, Blood Spiller, Edge of Darkness, Siphon Strike, Edge of Darkness, Blood Spiller. So there's a lot going on here. We moved Blood Weapon to right before the pool. This is because our new plan is to use TBN before the pool as well, dropping our mana before we even begin the fight. Without this TBN, you will lose 600 MP, which is okay. It is undeniably a loss, but for consistency of practice, if you know TBN will not be broken, will not grant you Dark Side, just skip TBN and overcap by 600 MP. Keep the opener the same otherwise. All openers from this point forward will include TBN, even if I never show it being used. If you get into higher difficulty content, you'll want that TBN. Moving onward, our first weave will be an Edge plus Delirium. As mentioned before, Delirium has extra time on it, so we don't need to immediately start spending stacks. Use it now and then continue with your combo as normal. After Soul Eater, we can throw out Salted Earth. Another major note here, we do not use Edge of Darkness here, but we could. Rather than later, we could use one now. But again, muscle memory for later openers. Salted Earth is going to be paired with another skill in future openers, so the call is up to you. Same goes for the Carve and Spit and Plunge. Our GCD ordering is also very intentional. A full combo and then one hard slash spends most of all our blood weapon and takes as long as we need for everyone else to put up their party-wide buffs so all of our strongest skills will be buffed as much as they can be. And again, some of it will make more sense at 90. Otherwise, we're using our Delirium stacks, throwing out our edges, and coming to the Siphon Strike after three Blood Spillers. This Blood Spiller at the end is usable before Siphon Strike, but we are holding it back so far for, again, later reasons. We aren't going to get this Blood Spiller at level 80, for better reasons than Blood Spiller. But that's the level 70 opener. Again, we see Dark Knight has just so many weaves in its opener, and even has a lot it does before even pulling. So that makes a karaoke opener all the busier. I want to again stress that the names begin when the skill is recognized as being used by the game. The overlapping of names, don't let it confuse you. Pre-pull. Grit. Blood Weapon. The Blackest Knight. Provoke. Hard Slash. Edge of Darkness. Delirium. Siphon Strike. Soul Eater, Soul to Death, Hard Slash, Edge of Darkness, Blood Spiller, Carved Spit, Plunge, Blood Spiller, Edge of Darkness, Blood Spiller, Edge of Darkness, Siphon Strike, Edge of Darkness, Blood Spiller. Things that get a bit busier going forward, but not much in Shadowbringers. It's going to make a difference, but, well, you'll see. It's some good stuff. Level 74. Darkside Mastery, Flood of Shadow, and Edge of Shadow. 
Dark Side Mastery is just upgrading Flood of Darkness and Edge of Darkness into Flood of Shadow and Edge of Shadow. Because we all know, shadows are scarier. Looks like we'll all be making call-out posts on our Twitter.com. Anyway, Flood of Shadow has gone from 100 to 160 potency per enemy. This is a huge increase, especially because, you know, wall-to-wall -wall pulls and huge packs of enemies. Also big, but not quite as huge, is Edge going from 300 to 460 potency. The uses of these are otherwise all the same. Flood is now just completely better on three or more enemies. Level 76, Dark Missionary. On a 90 second cooldown and with a 15 yarm range, this reduces all magic damage to allies within range by 10%. The buff lasts for 15 seconds. You're basically never going to be using this for yourself. It's the Dark Mind issue, but an AoE. As a result, we're going to use this for protecting the entire party, or at least as many people in range as we can get, from raid-wide AoEs. There are a few exceptions to the rule of raid-wides being magical based. They exist, but for the most part, if an attack is going to damage everyone no matter what they do, Dark Missionary is going to protect them. This is especially important in higher levels of content where raid-wides just hurt a lot. Even without people making mistakes, it's a lot of damage and even a little bit of protection goes a long way. The only issue is the cooldown length. It's not overly long, but you need to use it on the biggest points of damage if you can. Sometimes it will be magical mechanics instead of raid wives, but you'll get used to where to use it as you get more practice. Level 78, Enhanced Plunge. Plunge has become a skill with charges. Charges can store in multiple uses, and the moment you use one charge, the timer will begin to count down to the next usable charge. In total, Plunge has a 60 second cooldown, 30 seconds per charge, for its cap of two charges. This means you can always have one charge stored while using the other for pure damage. Unless the fight will have two back-to-back -back situations where you end up far away, you only need to be holding onto one for the gap closing effect. Which, the fight you're seeing is one of those fights. But this is uncommon. Otherwise, it's an extra attack to weave in every now and then. Level 80, Living Shadow. On a two minute cooldown and costing 50 gauge, this will summon Esteem to your side. They are functionally a fancy dot, but also sometimes AoE. They will lock onto whatever enemy you are targeting until it dies. Even if you swap targets, Esteem will not. They do attacks of 240 potency with a set order of attacks after a lengthy summon animation. Abyssal Drain, Plunge, Quietus, Flood of Shadow, Edge of Shadow, Blood Spiller, Carve and Spit. The attacks that you would expect to be AoE are indeed AoE. Unfortunately, that's only three of the seven attacks he does, but that's more than plenty of an excuse for you to want to use this in both bosses and trash fights. At a minimum, that's 1680 potency of damage for just that 50 gauge and a weave window. In AoE, well, subtract 720 and multiply it by the number of enemies before adding it back in. Simply put though, you're using this on cooldown. Big damage in the form of a fancy dot. Also, remember? Esteem withdraws from the battlefield. Esteem withdraws from the battlefield. Esteem withdraws from the battlefield. But now we have to talk about the level 80 opener. As I mentioned before, we're adding a little bit, but not a lot. We have Living Shadow and a second plunge, but the positions we add... Well, the position we add Living Shadow is important. The second plunge is whatever. Notice all the room for weaving and plunges so far away? Yeah, level 90. Again, Plunge's position is whatever. Living Shadow, meanwhile, is used as soon as it possibly can, along with Salted Earth. Living Shadow is our biggest hit, even if it technically is 7 hits with a long windup, but costs us 50 gauge to use. When under Blood Weapon, a full combo will put us at exactly 50 gauge, so you literally could not use Living Shadow any earlier than here. But that's really all there is to it. Double weave in your Living Shadow as soon as you can, and you're good. Because of how little we've added, let's just move into Endwalker. It's not worth a karaoke opening now, but it will be with how busy we're about to get. Level 82, Oblation. This has two charges, with a charge time of 60 seconds. This can be placed on yourself or an ally. It reduces damage by 10% for 10 seconds. Just like the Blackest Knight, this can save the life of an ally or be used on the main tank for tank busters. It's just not as strong. It has no MP cost to entry and not too long of a cooldown, but it's only 
When using it on yourself, it's very good for pairing with other cooldowns. Oblation with Rampart so it's not as basic a defensive, for example. Or even Oblation with the Blackest Knight. If nothing else, you can use it alone for smaller bits of constant damage. And the fact it has charges is in itself a useful feature. Keep it on cooldown to roll the charge time while keeping a charge for every tank buster. It's not nearly as exciting as what other tanks get. Level 84, Enhanced Unmend. So this reduces the plunge cooldown by 5 seconds for every use of Unmend, with rare exception. Why? I don't know! At most you'll get one more use of plunge, assuming specific kill timings. If you're using Unmend that much, you're either doing some very intense raiding, which even Ultimate doesn't call for a lot of Unmend, other than Double Dragon Phase, or you're playing pretty ineffectually. Level 84, Melee Mastery. This is just a bunch of potency boosts, but also a bit misleading in the tooltip. Hard Slash is increased to 170 potency, Siphon and Soul Eater are boosted to 120 potency, but this also boosts the comboed potencies. Because of this, they are now 260 and 340 potency each. Level 86, Salt and Darkness. This is an upgrade to Salted Earth. Upon placing Salted Earth, it will turn into Salt and Darkness. You will get one use of Salt and Darkness due to its 20 second cooldown, and you must use it before Salted Earth expires, because this will cause Salted Earth to pulse. All enemies inside the bubble will take damage. The first enemy will take a whole 500 potency of damage, with all enemies beyond the first taking 250 potency. This is an extra little bit of attacking you could do after any use of Salted Earth. Don't forget to use it. Especially single target because 500 potency. Level 88, Enhanced Living Shadow. Living Shadow is now even more important. Its attacks are now worth 300 potency. That's a massive 2100 potency, not accounting for any AoE power you get out of it. Level 90, Enhanced Living Shadow 2, and Shadowbringer. Let's start with the Living Shadow bit. The Flood of Shadow is replaced. Instead of a 300 potency strike, it is 450 potency as Shadowbringer. Any enemies after the first target will take 337 potency of damage. What's Shadowbringer? No, not that. It's a skill with two charges. The charge time is 60 seconds. This is the same size as Flood of Shadow and does 600 potency to the first enemy. 300 potency to all enemies after the first. Because of the charge time, you can hold onto your charges to use both every two minutes and align for re-openers on bosses. Or you can just use them on cooldown. And you really should if it's for AoE. The only real note here is that it can only be used under dark side. Which you're putting up and maintaining easily anyway. So use on cooldown or save for every two minute burst windows. But make sure you're not ignoring it. It's a big burst of damage. So much so, Dark Knight is actually close to the highest DPS of the tanks. Really? So caring about all his weaving and big damage numbers is actually kind of important. Which is why we're coming in for the final opener at 90. We're gonna fill in all the holes in the weave windows so we have double weave after double weave. Pre-pull, Grit, Blood Weapon, The Blackest Knight, Provoke, Hard Slash, Edge of Shadow, Delirium, Siphon Strike, Soul Eater, Living Shadow, Salted Earth, Hard Slash, Shadowbringer, Edge of Shadow, Blood Spiller, Carven Spit, Plunge, Blood Spiller, Shadowbringer, Edge of Shadow, Blood Spiller, Salt and Darkness, Edge of Shadow, Siphon Strike, Plunge, Edge of Shadow. Let me remind you that the Blackest Knight is only for if it will break. If you know it won't be broken, just skip it. So the footage is showing no TBN even though the skill is being spoken. Double Weaving Living Shadow with Salted Earth makes a bit more sense now. Both are high potency and have a wind up with Salted Earth leading into Salt and Darkness. If we don't place down Salted Earth, ideally at an early point, using Salt and Darkness will be an issue. We use Shadowbringers with the next weave window to get the charges rolling sooner. That's why Carvin Spit and Plunge have been together too. Start their cooldowns, but after the stronger stuff. 
than the Salt and Darkness all the way at the end here because of the 15 second timer of Salt and Earth. We don't need to use it instantly, there is time, long as we use it before Salt and Earth ends. But otherwise, that's all there is to it. Again, this is very busy, but also your efforts are rewarded with some of the highest DPS of the tanks. Let's karaoke opener it to fully show how busy Dark Knight has become. Pre-pull. Grit. Blood Weapon. The Blackest Night. Provoke. Hard Slash. Edge of Shadow. Delirium. Siphon Strike. Soul Eater. Living Shadow. Salted Earth. Hard Slash. Shadowbringer. Edge of Shadow. Blood Spiller. Carven Spit. Plunge. Blood Spiller. Shadowbringer. Edge of Shadow. Blood Spiller. Salt and Darkness. Edge of Shadow. Siphon Strike. Plunge. Edge of Shadow. You have to work a little harder with your defensives too, in exchange for this power. Let me just also say though, reopeners tend to never require you to use your defensives. Raid wides are how most bosses begin, so you don't need to try to worry about a tank buster till after. There's very rarely overlap, so go do all the damage you can. Drink water, not anarchy. Thank you for watching this Dark Knight 1-90 leveling skills guide. Feel free to give feedback or ask questions on what might still be confusing to you. I am always seeking to improve, as should you. Don't stop with this guide, even if I succeeded in helping you improve. Please leave a rating, comment, sub, those really do help creators. Or even go follow my Patreon. Have fun in your adventures across Eorzea, and may the power of Anne and Hogs lay waste to your enemies.